Good afternoon to those of you in the Middle East and in Europe. Good morning if you're tuning in from the Americas and good evening to those of you in South Asia, Southeast Asia and beyond. On behalf of CPI Industry, publishers of Climate Controlled Middle East Magazine, a warm welcome to the third edition of the IAQ webinar series titled The Air We Breathe. My name is Surendra Balakrishnan and I'm the co-founder and editorial director of CPI Industry. Today, we are about to discover how even after conducting two editions of this IAQ webinar series, we still have so much more to discuss. COVID-19 has had such a profound impact on the collective psyche. And today, there's a steely determination to get back on our feet and reclaim our fundamental rights to unimpeded movement and professional and social interaction. The HVACR industry has a significant role to play in securing the perimeter that the built environment represents. Through cleverly controlling and managing the air we breathe, be it through filtering contaminants or humidifying the environment as a strong line of defense against airborne viruses, we have a clear pathway to supporting global efforts at combating the pandemic. And so here we are in this assembly of hope, determination, and expertise trying to make a difference. At last count, we are over 300 keen minds from over 25 countries in this virtual conference hall. Some of the finest minds will be participating in the plenary discussion and in the presentations to follow. And to lead the expertise to chair this important meeting, we are privileged to have Dr. Stephanie Taylor. Dr. Taylor graduated from Harvard Medical School in Boston, Massachusetts in the United States and has been a pediatric oncologist and cellular biologist for several decades. Alarmed by the high number of patients acquiring infections during their inpatient treatment, she became concerned that the hospital building had a role in these problems. To better understand buildings, she obtained a master's degree in architecture and spent several years designing hospitals. Dr. Taylor now works to understand and manage all building types to support occupant health and productivity. She is an infection control consultant, an ASHRAE distinguished lecturer, and a member of the ASHRAE Epidemic Task Force and Environmental Health Committee. We are indeed privileged to have her in our midst and to lead the discussions. But before I hand over the microphone to her, it is my beholden duty to thank our sponsors and partners without whose contribution this webinar could not have been a reality. First and foremost, our heartfelt thanks to our bronze sponsors, Grey Wolf Sensing Solutions and Krivan, our associate sponsor, Pro IAQ, the Swiss IAQ specialists, our IoT partner, SenseGreen, our strategic knowledge partners, AESG consultants from the UAE and, the, and Protec Suhaimi Design from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And our strategic HVSR recruitment partner, www.careersbay.com. Once again, our heartfelt thanks to them for so willingly supporting this very important meeting. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to pass on the virtual microphone to Dr. Stephanie Taylor. Hello, uh, everybody. Uh, I'm very honored to be here. Uh, I wish I were there in person, but we're all doing the best we can. And I like that message about uh, we're all here with hope and moving forward to do the best we can in this difficult time. Thank you for that nice introdu introduction. And thank you very much for in inviting me to lead this uh, presentation. So with that, I will start uh, sharing my screen. And for the next um, little bit of time, and no more than the time I'm allotted, uh, I hope to open your eyes to some very interesting uh, information that is on the forefront of building management for health. So uh, my title, there is a title that I was supposed to have put on this, but what I decided to tell you 
right from the beginning is that the health of the public is in the hands of building professionals, uh, much more than uh, clinicians. This is, this is my experience and my opinion as both a physician and now someone who works in architecture. So this is me when I'm uh, getting ready to see patients. Um, and I'm very happy to be with you this morning. So the, the three things I would like to talk about in the next 20 minutes or so um, are, as you can see here, COVID-19 uh, COVID has really refocused or focused our attention on how important the built environment is for our health. And in that way, uh, those of us who are managing buildings can be grateful that instead of taking 50 years to, to achieve this needed focus, COVID-19 has, has done this very quickly. And then I wanna share with you some studies on human health uh, and how the indoor environment impacts human health. And then for the third part, um, begin the discussion about how we move forward with these, uh, these new data points. So before I get into the actual uh, meat of this presentation, I just want to tell you a little story about myself and how I came to be here as a physician talking to this wonderful group. So this is me back in uh, when I was in medical school a few years ago. I decided I wanted to have an adventure. So as a, in the middle of medical school, I went to Papua New Guinea and I worked there for four months uh, doing medical work. And it was an absolutely wonderful experience. The hospital that I was based out of was this, this uh, facility you see here, the WIWAC General Hospital in Papua New Guinea. And I was, I was amazed at how well these patients did. On the right, you can see me in the operating room. I have flip flops on my feet. That was, uh, that was the normal footwear for the hospital. And in the middle, you can see immense tuberculosis ward, a lot of open air ventilation, the beds were close together. So this isn't the, the type of facility we really see in the US or in the Middle East generally. And yet these people did very well. Patients did not get new infections from the hospital. And when again, I thought about this, and this is, my mentor in medical school, Dr. Folkman, he and I were doing cancer research with black mice. And one night uh, around 11 o'clock, I realized that a lot of our mice were dying. So I called him up and he came into the operating room and we scrubbed it down from top to bottom. And Dr. Folkman, who is a brilliant man, said to me, never underestimate the power of the environment in our health. So I feel like I've come full circle in some ways uh, in my career. And speaking about the environment, if we do a, a very brief uh, history course, you know, a long time ago, we lived in, in dwellings that had a lot of communication with outdoor air, soil, uh, water, animal material. Our building techniques became more sophisticated. We developed sanitation systems. And really by the, the 1800s, unless you were in farming, or in agriculture, most of us lived and worked indoors. And now in 2020, especially since the uh, energy embargo of the 1970s and 80s, many of us live or work in buildings that are sealed up. A lot of us don't even have operable windows. The, the building is warm. We could go to work in our bare feet if we were allowed to. There, they Beautiful buildings, very sophisticated. But unfortunately, we've also seen a rise in, in many diseases. So despite the increased building hygiene, we have more infectious diseases. We don't even need to talk about that because we're in the middle of that. But in addition to infectious diseases, there's been an increase in autoimmune disorders and in many inflammatory diseases. So it bears taking a look at, is there a relationship between how we're managing our buildings? We're, most of us spend about 90% of the time and these increased disease rates. At least we should ask the question if we're doing something that fosters an increase in diseases. So now we're in the middle of this COVID-19 pandemic. It's not the first and it's not gonna be the last. All of these events that are, are shown here were caused by the same type of virus, a, a single-stranded RNA virus. 
The thing that's unique about this category of virus is that they mutate quickly and easily. And so if they find a new environment in which to occupy that they previously didn't survive in, and if they find a host that doesn't have an immunological defense mechanism, then they can take off and proliferate and cause the pandemic like we're seeing now. And unfortunately, this COVID-19 uh, virus has mutated in such a way that it attaches to deeper lung tissues so that instead of just getting a cold like most coronaviruses cause, instead of a, a fairly mild upper respiratory disease, we're seeing much more serious lung disease. So let's take a look at, at a few studies that begin to address the question of how is the indoor environment affecting our health? So I wanna give you a, a quick visual of how humans and microbes and particles interact inside a building. So as I'm talking and hopefully you're all breathing, Little droplets come out of our airways about 100 microns in diameter. They carry the particles, the viruses, bacteria that are normally in our airways. You can see as this engineer is working away, she's leaving her uh, skin particles and skin cells and all of the accompanying bacteria, staph aureus, and things that are normal. She's leaving them on the paper and on the table. You can see particles coming out of her nose. That's totally normal. She's not dripping anything. You can see that her gastrointestinal tract is illuminated. We have a lot of particles and bacteria and viruses in our GI tract that we emit one way or another and, and enter the environment. You can see that there's communication between surfaces and air. Particles that are on surfaces get resuspended and resettle. And then depending on how tightly sealed your building is, particles on the outside can go in and on the inside can come out. So if anyone is a germaphobe and is feeling alarmed, try to not be alarmed because most of these microbes are very good for us. And in fact, we couldn't live without them. But clearly not all viruses and bacteria are good for us or we wouldn't be having a virtual meeting, we'd be on site. So how do we begin to look at how our indoor conditions might influence those microbes and those particles that, that, that we introduce into our indoor environment? So I wanna take you through three studies that ask the question, is there a relationship between indoor air factors or the indoor environment and human infection rates? And a great place to study people in buildings is actually a hospital. So the first study was done in a hospital, but our findings actually relate to all people who are indoors. So if you don't design hospitals or if you don't manage a hospital, don't, don't zone out or start multitasking because the findings from this study, like I said, apply to all of us. So this is a study over a year um, in a brand new academic hospital in the Chicago area. A group of microbiologists was wondering how microbial communities enter a brand new hospital and colonize the building. So using very sophisticated uh, genetic analysis techniques, they were mapping the uh, integration of microbes in this building. And to understand if there was a relationship between the patient room parameters and the communities of microbes, they were following those parameters that you see listed. So every 10 to 30 minutes, they were measuring temperature, hand hygiene, room pressurization, lighting, CO2, uh, absolute relative humidity, room traffic, room air changes, and outdoor air ventilation. So we had about uh, 8 million data points over these 13 months. So I said, I'd like to, I would like to track patient infections in those rooms. Since we now have electronic medical records, we could do that uh, quite thoroughly. So think about all these parameters. Were any of those related to new patient infections? So we sent all this data off. Our statistician came back and said, the most powerful correlation with high infection rates was dry air in the patient room. So the red columns are the infections. The blue line is the average relative humidity for the 10 patient rooms and nursing stations. And as you can see, in 
late January, the, there were high infection rates and the relative humidity was at the low point. It was still about 32%, which is not too bad. If you're in the, uh, du I was in Dubai a year and a half ago, and as I recall, it could be quite humid there. But when the patient room relative humidity went up to 40%, a little higher, the infection rate came down. It was also seasonal. So I frankly didn't believe that this was valid data. So we got a new statistician who said, this is an independent correlation. Another study, because I was skeptical, was, uh, is still in progress. These data points are in a nursing home, and this is four years worth of data, where we are looking at the same parameters versus infections in the elderly population. And once again, we found that on the x-axis is relative humidity, and when the relative humidity was less than 40%, especially gastrointestinal and respiratory tract infections were high. And the infection rate came down and between 40 and 60% indoor relative humidity, we had an all time low. So that was very confirmatory of the previous study. This is a third study in a preschool. This was done by the Mayo Clinic in Northern Minnesota in the winter time. So cold outdoor air is brought in, warmed up, and unless you humidify it, the relative humidity goes very low. So they took half of the school and humidified to 45%, let the other half of the school just do what the building does in the winter. And they measured the number of airborne particles carrying influenza A. They looked at how active the influenza A was, and they looked at how many children were absent as a result of this one illness. And as you can see, in the humidified part of the school, you had about a third the number of absenteeisms as you do in the non-humidified part of the school. So this is a great study because it moves beyond correlation and begins to address causation because there was a simultaneous control. So let's just back up again and think about how can we, what are the steps where we can actually okay. the spread of disease? Three, three places. You can prevent uh, a person from coming in, say this person has COVID-19, you can pre prevent them from coming into your office or home and coughing. That's a behavioral intervention. And then the engineering controls are generally in the middle column. How do we diminish viral or bacterial transmission in our buildings? And the third column on the right, the health or the vulnerability of somebody who's not sick is usually supported by things like uh, vaccinations, getting a lot of sleep, eating well, etc. Let's take a look at the first part. So this is where the social distancing comes in, the recommendations to wear masks. That's to prevent the introduction of viral loads into our buildings. The second part, how do we diminish viral transmission through our buildings? Uh, and for those of you who are still wondering, is this virus transmitted over distances, there's enough data that says it is, that we need to manage our buildings as if, as if it, this is a very significant route of transmission. And on the ASHRAE Epidemic Task Force, our very first statement is, we need to manage our buildings to diminish long distance aerosol spread of COVID-19. And it ends up that multiple studies have now shown that when the relative humidity indoors is less than 40 percent we have greater longer aerosol transmission it's harder to effectively clean surfaces because of resettling and for reasons we don't fully understand in low relative humidity there's actually increased survival and virulence of many viruses and bacteria and this and it happens to be true for this uh, sars cov 2 virus so again, I'm talking, you're breathing, particles come out of our airways, about 100 microns in diameter. At 20% relative humidity, they rapidly shrink to very tiny sizes, become what are called droplet nuclei, and are, travel far and wide through uh, our buildings. This is a study looking at influenza A in guinea pigs. And again, on the x-axis, we have relative humidity. and the y-axis, you have infectivity. And you can see with the, the influenza, when the relative humidity is low, the infectivity is high. 
and something happens at 40% where that infectivity plummets. And in 15 minutes, 80% of the viral uh, particles are inactivated. So this is separate from clearing them from the air. This is actual inactivation. And in many, with many viruses and bacteria, that low point, that sweet spot is 40 to 60%. And then at 60%, you see an increase once again in infectivity. And we're finding this is true with the, the uh, coronavirus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Again, here we have days on the x-axis and we have viability on the y-axis. This is a logarithmic scale, so this is a very dramatic effect. At low relative humidity, at comfortable temperatures, you don't have a lot of inactivation or it's somewhat slow. At 80% relative humidity, you have faster inactivation. But in the middle of that 40 to 60% zone, you see we have rapid inactivation of the viral uh, particles, both in the air and on surfaces. So humidification is an effective strategy for both cleaning the air and for inactivating viral particles. And this, this graph, which I don't want to spend too much time on because I don't have much time, but this puts together the different uh, categories of infectivity and transmission. So if you look at the actual activity of the virus, the infectivity, contact transmission through surface um, contact, aerosol transmission through both large and small droplets, and you put all those together for an overall transmission risk versus relative humidity, we're seeing that at 40%, something very almost magical happens and the infectivity in the transmission is decreased. But what about this third column, which is usually left to the medical profession? You know, it's usually up to us to figure out how to treat people, how to bolster the immune system, and increase our strength. Well, once again, this is a study that came out about a year ago where a group at Yale was trying to under, oh yes, we have a Connecticut person here. So right in your backyard, Dr. Iwasaki and her lab was trying to understand what the physiological mechanisms were that contributed to seasonal influenza. Why do we get the flu in the wintertime when the indoor air is very dry? This study was actually done in genetically engineered mice to, because we couldn't do, they couldn't do it in humans because they have to take the lungs out and chop them up and you can't do that to your colleagues. So they genetically engineered mice to have the same immune response as humans. So what did they find? So if you think about how our body naturally protects us from uh, respiratory infections, you know, if a virus is in your, in your air, you inhale it, it goes into your airways, down your throat. The first line of defense is the mucus that lines your respiratory tract. And these little hairs called cilia, which are constantly washing upwards to keep these particles away from the deep, delicate lung tissue. That's the first step. If a particle does get through that barrier, there's cells in our, our respiratory uh, lining that actually come in and, and eat up those particles and try to prevent any ongoing damage. They produce proteins that are protective. And then if they need to, they activate the second arm of our immune system. It ends up that it, in, when the ambient air, the inhaled air is at a relative humidity of 20%, all of these natural protective effects are impaired. The mucus is thick, it doesn't capture the particles. The cilia can't wave upwards normally. The interferon and the proteins aren't synthesized and the, the cleanup cells do not work effectively. Versus at 50%, all of these natural systems are optimized. So I'm a, I, I don't sell humidifiers, I promise. And I don't even really like the word humidity because it makes me itch. So I use indoor air hydration to discuss this 40 to 60% zone that both decreases the viral load in the building and bolsters our immune system. And the thing about uh, humidification is that it works well with other indoor air cleaning strategies. It improves the efficiency of your filtration. Um, it works with... Uh, UV, you know, ultraviolet uh, germicidal irradiation. You have to keep your wavelengths appropriate, but it's, it's a strategy that is immediate, it's uh, effective, and it not only cleans the air, but it supports our immune system. 
And yet, most of us don't like the idea of humidity indoors. And I'm not talking about high humidity, I'm talking about this mid-range uh, 40 to 60 percent. Because why do we even have buildings? Yes, we want to be protected from the rain and the snow and floods and dust storms. We put a lot of emphasis into energy efficiency, which clearly is very important for fuel consumption and for outdoor pollution. But COVID-19 has really put our attention on the third reason we have buildings, which is to pr protect our health. And for that reason, I'm actually, I'm not grateful for the pandemic, I can't say that, but I'm grateful that we can now really focus on optimizing our health. So when I go back and think about Papua New Guinea, I think, okay, it's at the equator, the humidity was great, both outdoors and indoors. These, the people's immune system was probably very, uh, very uh, robust. And they weren't managing their buildings in a way that selected the most pathogenic organisms. So I actually believe that if we could become comfortable and develop the technology to safely humidify our buildings, dehumidify in some cases to keep them in this range, we can begin to turn around this, this alarming trend. So using health, using occupant health as a lens to examine indoor air quality, we learned that this 40 to 60% sweet spot is essential to our health. Low relative humidity is harmful to people and it benefits the bad microbes, the ones that make us sick. So we need to learn to uh, be comfortable with indoor humidification and to build our on building envelopes and our uh, mat materials so that we can support indoor air hydration. So I say thank you. I'm here with my buddy Luigi, who's under my desk, and I'm looking forward to hearing from the speakers and having a very energetic discussion. You can have this uh, presentation, and there's a bibliography for those studies. So now I'm going to stop sharing, and I hope I didn't go over the time. Okay, so now um, I want to, uh, let's see, sorry here. I want to introduce um, the next speaker, which is Dr., uh, and I apologize if I mispronounce people's names, Dr. Uh, Iyad Al-Attar. Uh, Dr. Al-Attar is a mechanical engineer and an air uh, filtration consultant. In 2008, the Filtration Journal, which is the official publication of the Filtration Society and the American Filtration and Separation Society, appointed him as an international member of the editorial board from Kuwait. He has lectured in many conferences and universities uh, to highlight the importance of air filtration performance for various applications worldwide. He is an editorial member of the Filtration Society. Uh, Canadian Green Building Council, the Combustion Institute, the International Society of Indoor Air Quality and Climate, the North American Membrane Society, the American Society of Heating, or ASHRAE, the American Society of Me Mechanical Engineers, and the Kuwait Engineers Society. So I now welcome uh, Dr. al -Attar. Um, Stephanie, if you could also introduce other panelists, and so then you can uh, okay. uh, have the plenary discussion. Thank you. Okay, so I should introduce everybody? Mm -hmm. Okay, so then we also have uh, Kandasami uh, on Balagin. Uh, Mr. Uh, he's a mechanical engineer with over 30 years of experience with 25 years in the Middle East. He has worked with leading industry experts like Atkins, uh, Arab, Arab Tech, Mario Associates, and others, and he's a part of many prestigious projects. With a vision to provide high quality and cost-effective solutions to clients and develop a team of highly qualified engineers, Mr. Ann Balligan started the company ProLead in 2005 and now leads a team of over 35 engineers in Dubai and uh, Chennai and operations in the UAE, Oman, uh, Belarus, Kosovo, and India. We have uh, Mr. Iyad Ismail. Uh, Mr. Ismail is a director of engineering at Raz Al 
Kalman Economic Zone, where he is responsible for evaluating business and engineering project strategies, as well as for leading construction and other engineering projects. In his role, uh, Iyad oversees the in infrastructural planning and infrastructural improvements of Rakaz's existing and new development areas for industrial and commercial zones. He also leads the development of processes at Rakaz, which is the Raz al Kalman Economic Zone, from feasibility studies and land acquisitions to the master planning and development of industrial zones and to the successful handling over of facilities to clients. Additionally, he supervises the operation and maintenance of the infrastructure and utilities and spearheads various energy saving and environmental initiatives. And we have uh, Dominic McPullen, who's the Chief Planning Ministry of Works in ba Bahrain, and I apologize for my American accent and pronunciation. Uh, Dominic is a central planning uh, at the Ministry of Works. He's a chartered town planner with two degrees in city planning, specializing in infrastructure. He is also a chartered planning and development surveyor, holding the postgraduate professional entry exams of the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors. In addition, he holds the RICS postgraduate diploma in project management and the ACCA postgraduate certified diploma in accountability and finance and an MBA in construction and real estate. He has worked at the ministerial level of Bahrain for 32 years, having previously worked in the United Kingdom, Germany, and Iraq. Wow, somebody likes school. I can relate. Uh, we have Dr. Simon Hugh Miller. Dr. Miller is a conformity program specialist at Abu Dhabi Quality and Conformity Council. He's led the establishment of the Abu Dhabi government's product conformity assessment services, including the mechanisms by which the government determines the impact of conformity assessment on the quality, safety, and performance for products in the Emirate. His work in pioneering the services and systems of assessment in a broad range of product fields relevant to public health infrastructure, sustainability, and emerging technologies is assuring the quality of thousands of products from hundreds of companies throughout the GCC. We also have uh, Pra, Mr. Uh, Nayak. Mr. Nayak is the Managing Director of Vastu and Engineering Services. He's a mechanical engineer with more than 36 years of versatile Gulf experience in design, site supervision, and product management of building services and infrastructure works with specialization in refrigeration and HVAC, including district cooling. We have Barry Wormald. Mr. Wormald is a director building performance at AESG. He is a chartered mechanical engineer with extensive experience in the building services industry in contracting, consulting, and client representation role. In, in various parts of the world, including the UAE, the UK, Australia, New Zealand, Oman, uh, the Russian Federation, and India. He has gained substantial experience in all aspects of design and construction during his career, and his innovative thinking nearly always leads to more efficient, cost-effective solutions for the, products, for the projects he is involved in. He has presented at a number of industry conferences on many subjects, including sustainability, sustainability and improving the efficiency in design and construction. And then we have Mohammed Zakaria. Mr. Zakaria is the chief consultant of uh, Proteo Cooling Division of Sumani Design. Um, Mr. Zakaria is a specialist in HVAC utility systems, control systems, and commissioning process. He has wide experience in Saudi Arabia with clients including Saudi Armani, uh, Aramco, um, SABIC, SEC, and Royal Commission. He has worked in various projects ranging from district cooling, healthcare facilities, plant support facilities, in-plant buildings, industrial projects, laboratories, universities, office buildings, commercial and residential facilities. And then we have Rick Stonier. Mr. Stonier is a ma managing partner, partner for US-based Gray Wolf Sensing Solutions, LLC and its Irish affiliate, Gray Wolf LTD. Rick holds a four-year degree in mechanical engineering and general science. Sorry, four-year degrees in those two areas. He's contributed to various industry indoor air quality guidelines and standards, most recently ASHRAE's new guideline, 
2009 measurement procedures for gaseous contaminants in commercial buildings. Then we have three more people. We have Palo uh, Maltini. Mr. Maltini is a managing director at Crewan Italia. He graduated from the Polytechnic in Milan, Italy in electronical engineering. He currently supports sales in Italy and MENA. Before this position, he was the South Europe sales manager at uh, Interacil, an American semiconductor manufacturer, and previously he held the role of application engineer management at NXP, formerly Philips Semiconductors. Then we have a, a pre-recorded uh, a pre-recorded presentation by Leo Schuler, Mr. Uh, Dr. Schuler, PhD, is the owner of Pro Ace a boutique company providing impeccable indoor air. His track record is well known in the industry, solving tricky IAQ issues that others could not. His holistic approach includes innovative and energy saving systems for microbial reduction and odor neutralization, leading to occupant invigoration and happiness. And then finally, we have Tolga uh, Kandon, Condon, who's the head of strategic business development and retrofit at SenseGreen. He's a multidiscipline engineer with his experience ranging from commercial applications to successful delivery of on-site construction activities. He possesses 16 years of experience with 13 years being in the UAE and the Gulf region in the construction and industrial manufacturing segments. He has been instrumental in completion of numerous key projects, such as the prestigious a Dubai Metro project. His core strength is in leading business development and strategy along with a comprehensive network in the Middle East construction industry. So we have quite a, quite a panel and I welcome uh, everyone. So let's keep moving on. So the next step is a uh, yeah, there oh. are a few questions that are coming in. Uh, if I may just read out a question from a member of the audience. And uh, this is from Mohammed Shoaib, who is a senior mechanical engineer, a third group consultancy, uh, who wants to know ventilation, air conditioning and filtration requirements of hospital, operation theater, isolation room and laboratories. How should we maintain uh, negative pressure in hospital isolation rooms do we add exhaust fan in addition to AC units? How much exhaust rate is to be applied? And uh, we'll have more questions as we go along, but uh, uh, Stephanie, if we can also ask questions of the panelists, please. So that, that sounds to me like a almost purely engineering question, although I do want to just mention that some isolation rooms are positive pressured, which uh, for highly, uh, immunocompromised patients. And operating rooms need to be positive, positively pressured to protect the uh, patient. But um, I would like to turn this question over to the engineer who feels the most qualified to talk about strategies for pressurization in hospitals. Would uh, Mohammed Zakaria like to take that question first and then pass on the mic to others? Thanks for having me. Uh, this is Zakaria from Saudi Arabia. Uh, actually, this is a very pure design question. Uh, to answer it in a simple way, uh, the standard that need to be followed is ASHRAE 170 standard, which is for uh, ventilation of healthcare facilities in particular. Uh, but when we talk about, uh, for example, operating uh, room or protective environment uh, uh, isolation rooms, the room must be in uh, the differential pressure of 2.5 Pascal need to be maintained between the room and the adjacent room uh, or the corridor, the adjacent corridor. Uh, to maintain differential pressure, uh, the, the basic technology that is usually you know, adopted is to have control valves on the supply uh, the the air supply to the room is connected through a <coughs> control valve, air control valve. The exhaust from the room is connected through an air control valve, and uh, the airflow, differential airflow that is required to maintain the differential pressure, will be controlled by tracking controls. 
by the volumetric uh, differential flow that need to be maintained. Uh, this is in summary the, the requirement and uh, if it is a airborne infectious isolation room, the room must be maintained negative pressure and the differential has to be maintained between the room and the anteroom or the room and the corridor. Uh, these are all the basic requirements. And I think uh, if ASHRAE ha handbook uh, for healthcare facility design, if, you, if somebody consult that book, a um, lot of those details uh, can be obtained with the examples and uh, you know, much more uh, detailed clarifications are available. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Dr. Uh, Mr. Naik, and I apologize for my pronunciation. Please. Would you like to? Please go ahead, uh, Prabhakar. You can speak now. I think you might be on mute. Yeah, I think you're on mute. Uh, Do you see a little microphone with a red line through the? Uh, Prabhaka, could you unmute yourself, please? Or use hand language? <laughs> uh, while we wait for him to unmute, uh, would uh, Dominic, yes, uh, why don't you go ahead, Dominic? Dominic, could you unmute? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Stephanie. That was um, a very, very interesting. Uh, from a government point of view, I have a very uh, straightforward uh, statement and a set of questions. Um, we're in the middle of emergencies. Uh, it's very hard for us in government who are making regulations, who are concerned with energy efficiency. We have green building codes. We are developing uh, these things as we, as we speak and we are enforcing them. Suddenly in the middle, suddenly in the middle of this uh, pandemic, we are asked to look to change regulations because there is a journey to be made between the science and the practice. And that journey has to be as short as possible. And I think uh, there is one thing talking to the private sector, talking to operators, even talking to consultants. I spent today talking to consultants. It's not enough. There has to be a government directive and an intervention like the lockdown or the social distancing in order to recognize the importance of what you have been saying to us. Um, this struck us early because we were watching, we were watching for example, uh, the, uh, the hospital in Italy under stress being overwhelmed. And while the interview was going on, the doctor was busy running down the corridors, opening the windows and saying, we need ventilation in this hospital and he's opening windows as he's being interviewed. That was the first time we actually thought about this, quite frankly. And we are trying to differentiate between what we are now commonly referring to as fake news. There's an awful lot of fake news out there. Uh, there's an awful lot of vendor marketing going on of equipment and solutions from vendors who, who, who see this as uh, some kind of um, uh, you know, uh, appropriate technology to offer. But for a government, we are looking for good science. What you've presented us today is good science on the humidity side. What we also need to know is where is the good science on the ventilation? Where is the good science on the most important thing to us in our sealed buildings, where we have 80% of air being recycled, is where is the good science to allow us quickly to intervene here on taking the hit, and it is a hit, we recognize we must take a hit on energy efficiency if we are to switch our priority from energy efficiency into public health in our sealed, non-ventilated, air-circulating buildings. This, I believe, is the front line and the moment when we have to come clean with the, with the good science, discard the fake news, and actually, I'm sorry to a lot of the vendors who are here today. It, it, it is not a marketing situation. It's a science moment. 
and we will come and we will look for the technology from the vendors once we have this clarity on the science. Thank you. Dominic, I, I think you've been incredibly articulate and expressed wonderfully really the conundrum that I see in place, which is how does the building profession suddenly begin to embrace health metrics? Because believe me, as a physician, we're hard headed. You know, we don't change easily. And for example, ASHRAE in the US, um, ASHRAE says to me, because I work a lot with ASHRAE, they say, look, we're into testing and balancing of equipment. You're telling us to test and balance human beings. That's not our area of expertise. And I say, I understand that, but you engineers need to learn medicine because us physicians are we're a little more resistant and, and we're, some of us are trying, but you're exactly right. How do you filter out data? How do you collect data on the impact of the indoor environment on people? You know, those, those platforms don't exist as robustly as we need them to. But I think you did a, a wonderful job at articulating, you know, the shifting from energy conservation to human health. And luckily there is overlap. You know, a lot of the strategies for a good energy building energy savings building also encompass some of the strategies for indoor air management for human health. But I completely see your conundrum or what you've articulated. So I thank you. I have a question. This is perhaps to the government representatives in this panel. So we'll be asking Dominic again to speak and also Simon. Uh, from the Abu Dhabi Quality and Conformity Council and Iyad Ismail from Rakes in Ras al Khaimah. Uh, the question I'm going to read it out is Do IAQ or IEQ related codes, standards, and enforcement measures need to be revisited or revised considering the specific nature of SARS CoV 2 and other possible strains in the future? Uh, Simon, would you like to go first or uh, after that, Iyad? Yes, I saw you raise your hand. Sure, thank you. So, and I also I'd like to just thank uh, Dominic for his words there. I think they're very prophetic, really, for for you know the times that we live in, and uh, you know coming from from our quality council and our, our product conformity division as well. We've seen in the last months a large number of products, and I can see even on the questions, the Q and A for this uh, for this webinar, um, questions about the types of products which can help the situation. And it's important to remember when it comes to codes as well that you know the the purpose of the air conditioning systems in most of these buildings and most of our buildings now, apart from hospitals, are to condition the air, not to treat or limit infection control. And so it's it's not we can't expect. I mean, controlling humidity, I think, is you know an excellent example uh, where you know where we have some science behind it to be able to help the situation. But to consider that all of the buildings that can suddenly become infection control facilities is, is not realistic. So this is why you know the governments have put a lot of their effort into infection control in terms of social distancing and uh, contact tracing, these sort of activities. This is the correct way to do it. Um, as you say, the, the availability of products that can help the situation or can be retroactively applied to buildings, UVC filtering, these sort of things, will come, um, but we have to be wary that uh, you know, they are backed by, by good science, as you said. When it comes to, to regulation and codes and standards, you know, I think um, we have a lot to learn, and, and I can remember some of these uh, discussions from, for IAQ and IEQ in the previous years. We've talked a lot about the conflict between uh, you know, green building engineering for energy conservation versus uh, you know, providing enough air and enough fresh air for people to, a, you know, to what is comfortable for humans or what is healthy for humans. And I think this situation is gonna revisit that question uh, quite honestly, you know, it's, and as Dominic has mentioned, a lot, of, uh, a lot of organizations and government bodies will be trying to see if, if the correct approach now is to increase the fresh air, increase ventilation. Um, and, you know, as you say, go back to the, the, the style that's done in Papua New Guinea. I think this is, <laughs> This is a lot to be learned, you know, in terms of healthy lifestyle is that closing ourselves in these boxes is, is really coming to fruition now with this kind of disease. I need to say this is not going to be the first or the last pandemic. So, you know, we will learn our lessons and we will try different things. Um, and, and, you know, eventually 
uh, or maybe even quite quickly these days, they will be put into the code, uh, to, into building codes and into practice to help us in the future. Okay, thank you. Uh, Iyad, would you like to uh, respond to that from a RAC, a RAC government perspective? Yes, of course. Uh, thank you very much, Linda, and thank you, Dr. Taylor, and thank you for many, th many thanks for the participant and uh, the panelists. Now, uh, as everyone aware that the world are, that the world that we are living at is not the same again. It's not the same, and for sure there is uh, there is many things we want to learn. Uh, like the like the, uh, the beautiful presentation that we got from from Dr. Taylor, we learn a lot. We need to learn many a lot. So uh, just to answer, uh, similar to, to my colleague, and Simon was speaking, uh, similarly, we need to learn a lot of things about uh, COVID-19, about the viruses, uh, how it moves, does it move through the air ducts? We are not sure how it moves, what is the things that, um, to prevent these movements, to what is the action that we need to do? And then we can look, of course, we need to look in the codes and the regulations and, uh, act, and act accordingly. Um, also, uh, as Dr. Taylor really pointed out, that uh, um, COVID-19 opened our eyes. She, in a very beautiful way, stated that opened our eyes on on the human side of uh, construction or, or building. And there is many things that we need really to take uh, to look at and to to consider. I think uh, going forward, and this is how we are thinking this way now. Uh, we really been very busy in the last years retrofitting buildings to achieve energy savings and doing a lot of uh, to achieve energy savings and get the financial uh, savings as well. And I think similarly we will be doing uh, to do sa to to save lives and the human as a priority. And it can be done together. So we I think going forward after the clarity and after the understanding and after codes and standards in place. We'll be looking at retrofitting buildings, not only, not only, mainly for health, and make it more healthy and um, more suitable for living. Yes. Okay. Thank you, uh, Barry. I saw you raising your hand. Yes. Okay. Thanks very much. And um, I'd just like to say the previous presenters have raised some excellent points. Um, I'm a mechanical engineer. I've been in the construction industry for 51 years now, and I'd like to just share some of the issues I think we're gonna face as an industry, because I've seen a number of the um, pandemics, the crises, the energy crises, sick building syndrome, um, sustainability accreditation coming that needs ventilation rates changing, and the buildings we're building now are no better than they were 50 years ago. We, we haven't learned. And, and we can come up with the best designs and the best ideas, but how do we put them into practice and make sure it's carried through? We have a, a large commissioning team here in Dubai. And what I see in buildings that are commissioned really frightens me when I think of, of some of the health issues that, that have been raised. And it relates in some ways to humidification. I'll raise that in a minute. Um, what Dominic raised about um, having products proven. Just a very simple example. I was in India for, for eight years from 2012 to 2018. And a client of mine, uh, one of the richest people in India, his wife was dying of, of cancer, lung cancer she had. And he asked me to uh, have a look at his house to see how we could improve the air quality in her room so that the last few months of her life would be, would be pleasant. So I turned up at his house, went into his in, into her bedroom, and I counted 32 different air quality implements within that room that he'd put in that various suppliers had said to him, this will solve your problems, this will solve your problems. And I asked him how many he'd run at once. And at one stage, he was running all 32 of them. And most of them were generating ozone, which in high quantities would, would be dangerous. So he said to me, um, look, uh, I managed to get rid of using all these because um, one of his friends was a top lung surgeon in the US. 
and he had designed um, an air quality treatment system that he put in near, near to a bed. He said it's been running now for six weeks and we believe things are improved. So I went over to have a look at it. And the first thing I noticed was the, the, the power on, on light was on, but there was no air movement. So I said to him, the unit isn't running. He said, no, no, it has to be running because it's checked every two hours. I, my, my maintenance team sign it off that it's operating. So I said, I can assure you it's not running at the moment. So we opened the unit up and the HEPA filters inside it were perfectly clean, not a speck of dust. So it highlights two problems. First one, um, the, the advice that's there and the proving of equipment to filter air until we can get something that's uh, proven, case studies done, and we're comfortable, it's at risk. The second issue is, who's gonna maintain it? We had a team of engineers who couldn't actually switch on a unit that was there to save somebody's life. Second thing, when we talk about ventilation to buildings, um, one of the things that, that um, improves uh, the risk of not spreading pandemics is, is more air. So if we get more air into buildings, I won't talk about the, the balance between um, energy saving and air, but we go into a lot of buildings and test the air flow rates. Very simple example, one of the newest high quality residential buildings in, in Dubai, we went in there to check the fresh air rates and the exhaust rates to the uh, individual apartments. What we found was the building had been open less than 12 months. The fresh air was between 27 and 46% of what it should have been. The exhaust rates in the bathrooms was between 34 and 52%. So we're getting half the ventilation rates we should be getting on buildings that have been designed by tier one consultants, built by tier one builders, and signed off by a team of people who are qualified to sign it off. So if we're gonna design systems, one of the first things I'll say is make them very simple. Very simple so that it can be commissioned, very simple so that they can be operated. And the second thing, it's very important that, that they are tested. We have case studies, that we have some great experts on this panel. You know, I've been working in the industry for 50 years. I am not an expert in air filtration. I know enough about it to understand where to say, let's get an expert in. I know enough to know what we should be using in different areas. But there are too many people out there at the moment, as Dominic, I think, uh, alerted to, who will say, we have a solution. And I've spoken to some of these people. I've said, give me a case study. Show me where it's been proven. Show me the technology behind it. Show me what the byproducts are so that we can understand if that filter's installed, what is it doing and what are the byproducts we have to be aware of. Because when you, you look at every filtration system, there is some byproduct from that filter. It might be a, a Passover of PM 2.5, but something is getting through it which may cause another danger. So they're the sort of things we need more information on from the specialists so that we can design the system. Sure, Barry. I mean, uh, when you spoke about an expert on air filtration, we do have an expert on air filtration, Dr. Yeah. Yadav. Dr. Yadav, yeah. Bring him in. Uh, I, uh, say, I just wanted, uh, I just wanted yes. to say one thing, Barry. I think you've highlighted another issue that I see from my perspective, which is the disconnect often between the building owner, the operator or the manager and the user. Yeah. And how do we align the um, responsibility for human health along those sectors? What, another, I'll just add a little point on that. When I came into the industry 51 years ago, um, in a design, there was an architect, an engineer, and a client. And I would sit in meetings, ask the client what he wanted, what his issues were. I would design the system. I would install the system. I would commission the system. And for 12 months, I would make sure... I don't think I've been on a project in 10 years where the same team has handed over the building that started during the design process. So there are too many people who get involved and fall out of that process. Yeah. Thank you. And Yad, would you like to comment on that uh, from an air filtration point of view, please? Uh, thank you, Surrender. Thank you for having me once again. I'd like also to thank all the speakers and the participants. 
I also would like to highlight what uh, Dr. Taylor has mentioned, and it's always good to have a medical uh, input. It is absolutely uh, precious to have uh, people from the medical sector come and have uh, their say because uh, they will help enlighten uh, engineers and other people in the field. Uh, I also want to thank Dominic for highlighting the point, which I'm going to talk, uh, be talking about, and that's the response time. Uh, I, I want to shake hands with uh, uh, Mr. Barry because he mentioned a very important point regarding filters and HEPA filters. Let me start by saying or asking a very important question. How did we end up here? How is it after 100 years of Spanish flu that our learning curve has not been steep enough? We've had in the past 60 years a lot of tools that were in our hands to be able to diagnose, characterize, prepare our response time. Uh, uh, COVID-19, SARS, coronavirus has paid us a visit and found us absolutely weak. You know, I mean, I I've been talking about this for the past four months and a lot of people are asking me, how can we improve filtration to, uh, to, to tackle the virus? I tell you what, you go, you know, pay a visit to your uh, fan call unit in your uh, office, especially, you know, offices or residential places, and you'll find there is like allocation of seven to 20 Pascal of aluminum filter uh, that is maybe 5% efficient. What is that gonna do for us? You know, I think we need not only to revisit the uh, international standards, but I, th I think question our seriousness, how much, actually we're willing to do change and turn the table on its head to be able to do that. The second most important point, which I go back to Dominic's point, uh, three things we need now to respond. How are we going to respond? When are we going to respond? And what is it we're going to use to respond? Let me first start very quickly by uh, uh, you know, pulling a trigger on standards. The most important part of our standards is we need to consider do we need more standards? Have we actually adhered to these standards that we've been previously having since, I don't know, the 60s? If we have and it failed, that means it's actually responsible of the situation we're facing today. If it has not, that means it has been incapable of confronting the pandemic, viruses, whatever it is we're facing today. Now, I know in filtration point of view, at least we have the ISO 16890. Now, again, for the past year and a half or two years, people have, are facing challenges, whether it's consultants or manufacturers or even users. A manufacturer is beating a consultant with a catalog that's updated with a new standard, the ISO 16890. If the consultant is still operating with the new standards, there is no conversation to be had. So I think we need to, fall, to make the international standards fall under the analytical knife. Not only question, not only revisit, but we need to challenge the standards and, and find out, are they enough for us to tackle the situation? It is, from my point of view, unacceptable being equipped with you know, top-notch technologies, but being locked at home for three months, you know, uh, seeing our uh, benevolence disappearing, our economies are falling, I think there's the gap between technology and application has gotten way too big. We've got to do something about it. So can I speak up here? Uh, so a great point. And I think you're harder on, uh, on the building industry than I am, because what I see from a medical perspective is that we now in 2020 are in a perfect position. We have new tools. So for example, in the studies that I mentioned, instead of using uh, the sort of older tools to analyze the presence of infectious organisms in our buildings, which the older tools are the Petri dishes and the microscope, we now have a whole new set of tools called metagenomics, where we can look at the genetic material of viruses and bacteria indoors. And using the older techniques, we thought that particles were often dead. They weren't infectious with the Wells-Riley equation, which is a very good uh, equation for predicting risk by airborne transmission. It looked like a lot of these particles were just dead and we didn't have to really focus on them for human health. But we now know because of these brand new tools that are used in building assessment, these metagenomics, that these particles are dormant, but they're not dead. So 
I agree with you that we need to, I love the way you said it, put the international codes under the analytical knife. But I think we need to be aware that we have new information now. And it's, it's exciting because we can use this information. We can use statistical mining uh, techniques with computers to integrate health data, microbiome data, and building management. But we didn't have these tools even a few years ago. So I think we need to be a little bit more kind on ourselves. And I think you must have teenagers or something. <laughs> Let me just, since you mentioned that point, just a couple of quick points on that, uh, on that issue. Uh, for example, one of the standards uh, uh, suggests for offices to install a 65% efficiency, a second stage filtration of 65% efficiency for the air handling unit. My question, like a five-year-old, why is it 65% efficiency? Why is it not higher? How do you expect a 65% uh, uh, efficiency to be able to be efficient in capturing any sort of microorganism. Second point is, I'm not asking that it should be 85 or 95. What I'm asking is the best efficiency possible considering the health aspect and the energy aspect. I think we have enough technology going. Uh, you know, uh, there's so much out there that can be, uh, we can select from, but most important of all, this is the best and the ideal time and maybe the, you know, a time that we need to realign ourselves, technologies and standards. There's too many gaps between you know, technology uh, uh, application and uh, uh, specifications. So everybody got uh, a role to play. Best time to realign ourselves right now. I believe uh, it's, a, it's a good chance for us to, to do it. I completely 100% agree with you. I think you said that so well. Um, I have, uh, we have consultants in the panel, so I just want to pose two questions to the consultants. If I may just read those. Uh, what radical HVACR design changes should we bring to the built environment in commercial facilities and for, uh, uh, also for special needs uh, people, those with uh, immune suppressed conditions? Uh, who would like to take that? Uh, I would like Zach and also Anbaragan and uh, Prabhakar Nayak and uh, Barry to respond to that, if you could, please. That's one question. The second one is the significance of testing and recommissioning of buildings. If you could address those, please. Thank you. you can I? Prabhakar, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you talked about number of air changes, am I right? That's right, yes, it was brought about yeah. by someone else. It, uh, yeah. I have an ASHRAE book with me, which varies from six to even 20 air changes. And a commercial building normally will have about six air changes. An operation theater may be as high as 20 air changes. So somebody talked about secondary filter being 65% is wrong. Normally, a back filter will achieve more than 90 to 95%, what is efficiency? It is nothing but dust holding capacity of a filter. So when it is a preliminary filter or a primary filter, that is 60% like a fan coil in it. But in an AHU, it is definitely more than 90%, and in HEPA, it is more than 95%. I've been in this industry for 36 years, and I handled Alain Hospital as well. And the air changes per hour in an operation theater is more than 20 with HIPAA filters. Okay, then okay. talking about positive pressure and negative pressure, again in ASHRAE, there is a guideline which room has to be under positive pressure and which is under negative pressure. Even for example, burns, they have to be about 30 degrees centigrade to heal the wounds, you know. You can't have low temperature. So, so talking about humidity, I will give an example of a Kent College, which is the KG 1 to 12 standard kids. Can you believe the DM regulation calls for 40 to 60% RH, but most of the time, this school is running about 80% RH, means they will get lung infection very easily. This is because the HVAC design has been made wrong. The, the what you call the 
design and supervision of the project itself has been done very badly executed. And I have done the postmortem of this as an audit after handing over. The humidity RH turned out to be more than 80%, which is worse than a COVID. Thank you, Prabhaka. We just need yeah. to move on. If we could yeah. bring uh, Anbaragan into the discussion, please. Anbu, would you like to comment, especially on the recommissioning of buildings, if you could please? Uh, yeah, I think uh, I'll just say even Barry and Dominic, they touched upon you know how the, uh, the disconnect uh, between the design, the installation and the commissioning uh, and why uh, many of these buildings, the codes and standards, even though they are being um, followed, but in the end, you know, you're not getting a right building. So there is something which is going wrong <clears throat> during the installation commissioning process. This I have been emphasizing, and many of the buildings in Dubai, though uh, the municipality has got good uh, codes and standards, and they do check the designs during the submission and the building permit stage. But the project is done, handed over to the client, and in the end, you know, when you just go back and visit, the building is not performing or functioning as per the intent, as per the design intent. So there is a complete uh, disconnection between the design and the final uh, end used, again, the project which is being handed over to the client. Why this is happening is that um, during um, installation, uh, the supervision is uh, probably weak. That is one angle. But more so in Dubai, I mean, I'm just talking in terms of uh, Dubai, which we have seen over the past 30 years, and the pace at which the buildings are being handed over, uh, what is compromised is the commissioning. Because most of the designs, uh, uh, the, the time period for the installation, it consumes probably 95% or 98% of the total project time, and you are left with very little time, which you know, is supposed to be allowed for. Like uh, normally we talk about a residential building or a commercial building or even retail facilities, which this is our uh, strength, which we have been handing over. We talk about uh, eight to 10 weeks is required for a proper commissioning of a building, which you know, you're talking about uh, uh, chilled water. Uh, I'm talking major, uh, the commissioning requirements are on the HVAC systems. So uh, you talk about uh, air side and uh, the water side. But the time which is given for uh, practically during this commissioning stage, because you uh, do get delayed in getting the power, but the time for the uh, occupancy, it just comes so near. And what they do is that they hand over the buildings without being commissioned. In many of the energy audits and even other audits which we carry out, what is found is really shocking because many of the times the systems are not commissioned and handed over properly at all. And we talk about uh, air handling units and uh, you know, or even chillers. All the major HVAC systems, they are uh, not uh, commissioned properly. Hence, what you're getting in the end is a very poor building like what uh, Nayak was mentioning about buildings with 80% RH, it is not just a design issue, but many of it could be during the uh, commissioning and handling, which is what Barry also was mentioning. Yeah, that's that's yeah. Uh, my point is that, yes, the buildings need to be- Thank used. you so much. Yeah, yes. uh, it, it, yeah that's, quickly, that's uh, yeah. Uh, we, uh, I would like uh, uh, Stephanie to uh, comment on this, but prior, I think we have a, a Iyad has raised his hand. If you could quickly make a point because we're running yeah, out of time. Yes, yes. Thank you very much. Yeah, yes. Just, yeah, just uh, about discussion about the system. Now, uh, I want to add to my colleagues what, what they have added. Now, for any system to function, for any system in any buildings, not even a system for a car, for a machine, for a factory, for whatever, any, any equipment to be performed well, need to be designed well, installed well, commissioned well, and then operated and maintenance well. So maybe uh, there is one of the, there is one of the issues that happen in, uh, in many buildings or uh, with uh, many landlords that the, the equipment, maybe the system that they have was perfectly designed and uh, was perfectly commissioned, but then, then they don't have the enough uh, or it was not maintained and operated as appropriate. And accordingly, you will not get the results 
that, that you need from that machine. Like running a car without sufficient oil, like uh, don't replace the, or not replacing the refrigerant for the chiller as bare manufacturer recommendations. So this is one of the things that causing a lot of issues for, for many buildings all over the world. And it's, it's really critical. So proper facility management, proper maintenance, pr proper operation, and then from the beginning, proper design, installation, commissioning, and then operation. Thank you, Yad. Uh, we have a question, uh, Stephanie, we have a uh, hand raised from Mohammed Zakaria from Saudi Arabia. Uh, could we have him speak? And then uh, maybe you can give the uh, closing comments for the plenary. Is that okay? Okay. Uh, yes, that's fine. I was muted. Okay, thank you. Uh, Zakaria, yes, please. Uh, please go ahead. Actually, um, uh, my colleagues have mentioned that there is a disconnect between the owner's requirement and the design team and then handover and then the O&M. Uh, there, there is a fundamental uh, misunderstanding that is still prevalent in spite of uh, um, having a commissioning process standard from uh, uh, ASHRAE, the prevalent misunderstanding is that commissioning process is something that needs to be done after substantial completion of the project. That means after all installation is over, somebody has to come in to commission the facility. But there is a standard in ASHRAE or guideline in ASHRAE called guideline zero. And I'm really surprised why they called it as guideline zero, because zero, which means it is purely common sense. Whatever common sensically you have to do, that is all listed in the guideline and that is why probably they call it guideline zero. So there, there is a commissioning agent or a commissioning party that has to be on board from the very beginning of the project to capture the owner's project requirement. Then that owner's project requirement has to permeate through the design process and the design intent has to be permeated through the contractor, the construction team, and then commissioning then O and M, and then during operation. So this process is called a commissioning process and there is a guideline, guideline zero. But unfortunately, the requirements of those guidelines are not followed even in um, important projects, even in important institutional projects. So this is one issue. The implementation could resolve uh, the connectivity problem. The second thing is because many of the buildings are not commissioned originally, they have to go through what is called as retro commissioning. That is a process by which the existing equipment and systems are brought up to its original intended uh, design intended operation. So that's basically the comment that I have to say. Thank you so much. Stephanie? So I, from my perspective, what I'm hearing is that we have two pre-existing issues in terms of managing buildings. One is given the current standards, how, how do we, uh, make sure that the building is being operated correctly. That's one issue that's existing. Another is how do you create more continuity between the building owner, the manager? How do we create a continuity of responsibility so that we ultimately are creating a good building in terms of energy and also protecting health? How do we, how do, we do that? And the third issue that I think is new um, that COVID-19 has brought into focus is the absolute need to protect occupant health in our buildings. So we need to, and the good news is, it's an incredibly powerful and effective tool that, that enhances what us physicians and medical professionals are doing. And I love the analogy with a car. You know, when I was looking for a car for my one and only child, who's a, now an emergency room physician, when he was a teenager, you know, I wanted to get the color he wanted. I wanted a great sound system for him but I also wanted it to be safe. And the safety uh, research on automobiles is very robust. And if something goes wrong, you either feel your steering wheel shake or the alarm lights come on. But in a building, the systems, if they're not working right, that's hidden. Most of us are filled <clears throat> inadequate. So how do we make how do we make continuity of responsibility and how do we make these systems more visible so that uh, if there is a defect or a problem, it's not hidden behind some wall? Dr. Teller? Yes. Uh, yes. 
Yes, Dominic and Iyad after that, and then we have to wrap up, I think. Uh, but just to let you know that we are also receiving a lot of questions from the audience, and we have allocated time for that. So I'm going to ask all of you to please stay back uh, and be part of that very interesting uh, interaction with the audience. But uh, Dominic first, and then Iyad, and then I think, uh, Stephanie, we need to wrap up the plenary. OK. Yes, Dominic. Where is he? Uh, Dominic, you need to okay. unmute to Dominic. You're muted. Yeah, OK. Um, yeah. If you look around at the participants, most of you are in their, your homes. You're from your bedrooms, from your offices, et cetera. Um, what, what, what we are worried about is when we come back to the offices and we have a second wave of this, we can't have a committee meeting in the fire station about the fire. We need to act. If this is a building issue, if it's an air circulation issue, or if it's a ventilation issue or a humidity issue, we can't have a committee meeting in the fire station. We have to get an addressing this. Can we get something before we all return to the offices and before we have a second wave that is, that is turning uh, some kind of empirical evidence that all of the things we're saying about theoretically are actually a very real fear and a real issue for us to cope with. Thank you. Yeah, quickly, uh, if you could. Yeah, very quickly. I just want to comment on the 65 issue, uh, the 65 percent issue, and how this is wrong. Uh, I just want to be everybody to be aware when you address the word efficiency, uh, please ask the person uh, on the other side of the table. What efficiency are we talking about? I think this has been uh, misrepresented in the industry. When we say efficiency, we take it for granted. What is missing in the uh, conversation or in the technical discussion is, if this is a 65% efficiency filter, what is the uh, particle size distribution and concentration that the filter is up against? Now, a lot of industries are moving from pocket filter, for example, to pleated filters to increase surface, surface area. But just to, to go back and uh, make sure that we're clear, I invite the gentleman, I'm sorry I don't know your name, but thank you for highlighting this. I invite you to go to table E1, page 39 of the ASHRAE standard, and look where commercial buildings are mentioning MERV 8. MERV 8. Uh, we need to uh, not really follow the standard blindly. I think we need to re-examine and make, analyze the standard in a way that we can have a uh, version that will fit our needs. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, with that, we have to conclude this uh, plenary discussion, sadly enough, because it's been a great, great discussion so far. Uh, I'd like to bring my colleague, Frederick Paye, uh, to make a brief presentation. And Frederick, if you could, if I could ask you to please rush with your presentation. We really are uh, behind time. Thank you. Sure, thank you, Surinder, and uh, welcome to all of you to this third uh, IEQ webinar. It's a pleasure to see you all. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Taylor, for being with us today. It's, it's a great pleasure and honor. And thank you as well, uh, Rick, uh, for being uh, with us so early, for getting up to be so early to be with us today, and to all of you who have tuned in again from uh, 29 countries uh, today. Um, now, I would like, obviously, to, to proceed with the, uh, the sponsor recognition ceremony. Okay. Right. Uh, in our bronze sponsor category, we have uh, Grey Wolf uh, Sang Sing Solutions. Thank you very much for your support, as well as Cree One uh, from Italy. Uh, our associate sponsor today is Pro IEQ, the Swiss IEQ specialist. Thank you very much. Our IoT partner, Sense Green, I believe, they are launching their uh, startup as well. They will tell you more about it later. And our strategic knowledge partner, AESG. Uh, and Protect Cooling, uh, Suimi Design from Saudi Arabia. Our strategic HVACR recruitment partner, CarriersBay.com. And now we'd like to take you through our uh, upcoming webinars. In uh, uh, four days, uh, uh, five days, sorry, from now, we on the 29th of June, we have a webinar on fire safety, 
towards a state of calm, insight and recommendations on fire prevention and fire protection. Uh, then on the 9th of July, we shall be holding uh, a webinar on business continuity and confidence building measures. On the 16th of July, a truly global event um, on refrigerants review. Um, and then on the 19th of July, uh, a webinar focused on smart HVAC systems and the importance of IoT as well uh, in today's environment. Uh, and hopefully by September, we shall be able to resume our physical uh, events a series in hotels. If that should be the case, then we look forward to seeing you in person again, uh, safely, of course, uh, for the Client Consultant Contractor Conference in its fourth edition on the 15th of September in a hotel in Dubai. And then uh, the new category shall be unveiled very, very shortly. So please, please do check our website regularly uh, for our landmark event, which is the 10th annual Climate Control Awards 2020, happening on the 24th of November in Dubai. And now I would like also to bring you to your attention uh, to not only the, the building, but the human filtration aspect as well. I was reading a very interesting case study lately in the US that uh, there was a hairdresser who was practicing and who actually was positive for coronavirus. But as she was wearing a mask, she didn't manage to uh, con contaminate none of, of the clients. So that really highlights the importance of uh, face masks. And uh, we are delighted to announce that we have partnered uh, with a local company entitled uh, Concept Arabia to launch a customized face armor PM 2.5 filters filtered mask. Okay. And as you are all aware, the mask, face masks are mandatory outdoors and indoors in certain office conditions in the UAE. So to that effect, we are delighted to partner with this uh, company. Um, the um, face mask can also be uh, branded, okay, with your own logo. The filter also can also be changed. Uh, they come also in different colors and be branded. Okay, and they are also customized and reusable with carbon activated filters and a breathing valve as well. And moreover, they are also available with glow in the dark printing for uh, extra security measures. If you consider the, you know, the, the police or civil defense who also have to work at night. These masks have also a lifespan of more than five years in low moisture storage conditions. And here are the contact details. Please do not hesitate to reach to us for further details. So to, for that concludes my session. Thank you very much indeed for your support and for tuning in today. So now I believe we interface with the audience. Questions? Please.